Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three um, books, PDFs, that are really useful for GMs that are pretty much system neutral. Those are, the time, those are the types of GM materials that I tend to prefer. You know, system specific materials are really good if you're, you know, just running that one system and stuff. And often you can take from any system specific book and, you know, convert it into other things. But system neutral, in my experience, people who present system neutral ideas tend to be really creative. And maybe that's just, you know, I, the stuff I've been running into. But I, I really like the system neutral books that I have. And these three books that I'm gonna be going through today are, are no exception. So the first is Into the Weird and Wild by Charles Ferguson Avery. This is a 248 page PDF that turns the wilderness and the, that sort of you know side of the game, wilderness expansion, into a horror game basically, or at least into mild horror. I think often pretty horrific. If you've ever been lost in the woods, this book is for you because you know like we tend especially in D&D terms we tend to think of the wilderness as like you know the place you pass through to get to the dungeon but you can turn it into a really interesting engaging terrifying place and i think that uh this book helps to do that really really well so i'm going to be going through this one uh, it's again 248 pages so it's quite long i don't know if i'll go through the whole thing but i, I will cover some of it the second that I want to cover is Gentle's Dungeon Guide 2. Now, I've talked about Gentle's Dungeon Guide 1 before, and that's a pay-what-you-want on DriveThruRPG. Gentle's Dungeon Guide 2 is 70 pages as opposed to like 12 or 15 or whatever the first one is. It's not pay-what-you-want. I think it costs... You have to actually pay for it. <laughs> but it is really, really good, and it just expands everything that you found in the first Gentle's Dungeon Guide. Now, this is... It's designed for the Shadow Dark system, but it's basically system neutral because you're, you're rolling on tables to create your dungeon and there isn't a lot of mechanical tie-in with a lot of that stuff so you know it, it easily fits into shadow dark but it really also easily fits into anything else and i love the aesthetic on this one too the first two books the aesthetic is great and then the third one i wanted to cover is not necessarily even like that uh well i don't know it's it's the great book of random tables i got this as part of a i think it was a humble bundle so I actually don't know how much this one costs on its own. <laughs> you can find it on DriveThruRPG, uh, certainly, and I'll put links to it below. Um, but I'm always a sucker for random tables, and this book is 175 pages of random tables. Now, one of the downsides of these sorts of random tables is that you can basically find this stuff for free with a Google search, these sorts of random tables. And you'll see what I mean. Like, this book is a great compilation, and I got, like, in that Humble Bundle, I think I got, like, 25 different documents all full of random tables. And they're all like 150 pages, so it's just, you know, so much. It's harder for me to find and, and make my way through it than it is to actually just Google it. So I often don't use them when I'm doing my prep, which is kind of unfortunate. But some people really like having these random table books up at the table especially. And if you open like 10 of them, you would basically, and just have them you know open in the background, you would have just instant random tables for tons of different things. And so I'll show you when we get into it. Um, there's a lot of really cool ones. But let's start with Into the Weird and Wild. So this one is explicitly system neutral, and he actually talks about uh, the system neutrality of the book and what that means and, and you know why he does it. But here's a basic index of the book. You've got uh, everything's hyperlinked, which is cool. A good portion of this book uh, is monsters and really, really, really cool, creepy monsters out in the woods. Now, there's great art throughout. It's very consistent. It's all done by the same artist, and it, I think... And it all just draws you right into a very particular image of the woods. Now, it is kind of horrific. Often, it's pretty dark. And it is, uh, it's given that tone. So if your campaigns don't have that or you're not interested in kind of adding like a darkest dungeon, and that's how I kind of feel like the darkest dungeon uh, wield, you know, like that one zone in darkest dungeon, which is like the kind of blighted forest. That's what this kind of brings me to think of, makes me think of. Um, if you don't want that tone in your game, you're probably not going to like this book so much. But it's great just for the stuff that's in this book, random tables and uh, ideas. This is the kind of art you're going to be looking at throughout. Right? Sketchy, um, not really refined, but, but almost like someone recounting after the fact what they saw and just like sketching it really quickly or telling someone and they sketch it based on their description. And so it feels very visceral in, in, in the world. I like it a lot. Uh, it has that really disturbing tone at times. So, system neutral and what that means, an introduction to this book and kind of what it's going for. The woods do not care for you. Never forget that. That's kind of the motif, the, you know, the theme behind this whole book. They don't care for you. Uh, in fact, it's often really, really anti you. <laughs> they, they want to destroy you. Um, but it's really, really cool. Like, oh, yeah, great art like this throughout. I like that sketchy, um, 
you know, like like someone's just kind of walking through the woods, sketching it as they go. I like that that method. And there's something like this, which is much more, you know, uh, particular. But it still gives you that idea. You're about to enter the woods. You know, that determination, but also you know, that loneliness, that isolation. I like this picture quite a lot. The rule of gold, right? Money is a construct of the civilized world. It has no place in the woods, and so you use supplies instead of gold when you're when you're really going out there. And rules, new rules for exhaustion that you can use in your games, which I think is cool. Now again, it's system neutral, so these are given in general terms, but they're rules that apply to most games. Um, and then surviving the night, new rules for camping, and I kind of like them actually. Uh, I don't know if I would use them in every game, but for certain styles of game, uh, I think this would be great. And an example of play there. And then hunting, how to hunt, uh, how to get closer to your quarry, uh, all that. Possible setbacks and boons, how to clean a body, which is, you know, again, if you're going to be out in the wilderness hunting and all that stuff, this book would be a great way to kind of introduce you to that concept. The moon phases and what that might mean for the world. Special moons, the call of the wild, possible triggers for the call. The wilds are not just a place, but a force. And then becoming lost, rules for becoming lost in the woods, madness. Really creepy piece of art there. Really terrifying, but sketchy. I love it. Beasts of branch and bone. Okay, so this is the monster manual we get here. And stat blocks and how to read them for this book. The Aleper? Aleper? I don't know how to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to know how to say a lot of these names. You get a snake there. The Arcanus Arachne. It's a magic spider. The Bowick. Really creepy. I mean, it basically looks like a ghoul. Um, blight motes. And one of the things that you get in this book is like not just the stats, because it's system neutral stats, so it gives you very generic stats, but then descriptions of what they're like. Basically, in a couple pages at least of information about them. And I like this one, it has a little actual, like, you know, maybe a child's drawing of this uh, thing. The Blukstond. And you get. Again, more information about it. From time to time, you'll have these things that, uh, those little sidebars called uncommon goods and things basically that you can get from the creature. Some prized, you know, um, thing that comes off the creature's body or its fur or whatever it might be. And uh, and then you can, you know, use that in your own campaigns. The Bramble Beast, the Briar Scoffs, the Cacophonous Croman, the Cherubs is so super creepy to me. Super creepy. <laughs> Children of the Woods, uh, the Cinder Shams. Really creepy, creepy, creepy images, right? Devil Stag. So when you're talking about the dire horsehair worms, when you're talking about adding this, the dragon tick, some people, ugh, the Dreati, um, when you're talking about adding this into a campaign, you, you're going for a very particular tone. This is not just going to fit into any campaign. Horror is, uh, you know, old school D&D, &D, I think people have talked about this before, old school D&D &D is more akin to survival horror than it is to... Uh, to like you know action adventure or high or high her heroism or something like that. Like it's, if you read the old Conan the Barbarian books too, that sword and sorcery tone, like very often you get this. It's right adjacent to like cosmic horror, right? I mean, H.P. Lovecraft and uh, and uh, Robert Howard were, were I don't know if they were friends, but they certainly corresponded and they shared you know um, pulp magazines that they wrote together for <laughs> in you know. And so they're right adjacent to each other. And so um, I think more modern D and D is much more akin to you know high fantasy, uh, you know. Uh, that sort of thing. But this would fit with a more old school vision of D&D. Much more survival horror where the creatures, and especially when you add new creatures into a game, that's the easiest way to kind of scare your players. Because most of your players are familiar with the creatures in the monster manual. They know what they're called. And if you call them that, right, that's <laughs> they'll, they'll know what they're facing. But you throw a new monster manual at your creatures with new monsters they've never seen before. Or you rename creatures that they're kind of familiar with. Or you don't name them at all. You just describe them. It can really be an effective way of scaring your players. I think that's awesome. And so this book it would be great if you wanted to move more in that direction. The different dryad creatures, ether rats, false beggars. That's a great one. False beggar curses, right? So you go up against this guy, and if he curses you, then they're really bad. You can be rendered bl both blind and deaf. Lose 1d6 to all ability scores permanently. <laughs> you develop insatiable cannibalistic urges. Like, this is really difficult. You permanently acquire three random diseases. This is really bad. Now, these guys are not necessarily malicious or sadistic. They're harsh justicators, punishing those for failing, not for failing to give them specifically, but failing to be charit charitous or charitable in general. 
they're not they can be cruel but they're not necessarily evil so if you pass by one of these guys and you don't help him or you don't help anybody else then they will destroy you right come to your camp at night and ask for help and if you turn them away uh oh you better be careful I think every creature in the book, not every creature in the book, but a lot of them are as cool as this, in my opinion. I love them. The Feral Knight, the Gastropol, the Jeroa, Goero, Goro. <laughs> you have to figure out how you're going to name these things. The Grim Kings. Um, the air grows silent and still. A rhythmic rumbling courses through the ground. The sound of giant footfalls draw close, and soon the whispering growls of a hundred feral mouths grows in volume. Standing as tall as the largest of pine trees, a creature of bone, branch, stone, and horrid, writhing flesh looms. Cloth drapes over its profane form, and upon its shoulders sits a horrifying parody of a head enshrined in a crown. Super terrifying. Super, super terrifying. The master of the weird and wild. Right? These guys are... Horrifying. The Grim King's path goes unbroken by all. Woe to the world when it leads to our walls. Mm, mm, mm. So good and so horrible. Creepy, like a weird, creepy scarecrow. Gripple bats. Uh, and yeah, just so many good creatures. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. You can see there's just tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of monsters to this book. All right, factions of the weird and wild. The Court of Broken Branches. Great piece of art right there. The Curse Stitch. Such a cool idea. Children of the A. Creomoran. A. Creomoran. I don't know. I. Creomoran. They're a helpful hive mind. The Ruin. The Wild Elves. The Primal Wheel. And then artifacts of the Wild Hunter. Different things you can find in this world. And there's our magic items, but they're really cool magic items, like the Cold Fire Lantern. A lantern of blackened iron and etched with delicate silver filigree. Its fire burns the color of moonlight on a field of snow. A lantern that lights the way, but is devoid of warmth. It is said to house a mire ghost bound tightly inside of it. A Cold Fire Lantern produces light and acts and always as a regular lantern, but does not produce any heat when lit. Instead, the lantern radiates a faint chill. When used as a weapon, the lantern deals cold damage rather than fire as well. Snuff hounds are loath to come near it for some reason. So, you know, it's kind of cool. It's just a lantern that produces no heat. In fact, it's a little cold, and it keeps one of the creatures away, one of the kinds of creatures in this book, which is great. You could add that in and say that, you know, there's so many of these snuff hounds in the forest, you've got to avoid them. The only way is to get one of these cold fire lanterns. So, you know, maybe a quest to find it, and then you can pass through the wood. That'd be a great idea. The Megalith Mall. The Nature Himen Sword? Nature Himen Sword? Nature Himen? I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Again, you're going to have to figure out how to say these things because I, I can't help you here. Urn of the Thieving Wretch. That's really good. Let me read this one. A large, hideous urn made of stoneware and covered in an ox blood glaze. Crudely sculpted on its side is the vis visage of a deformed human, its mouth twisted in a monstrous grin. Long ago, a witch trapped a creature from beyond the shadows in this urn. It gifted her many great and terrible things, each stolen from a rightful owner. The urn of the thieving rat can be used once per day to steal any one object, no matter the distance or security placed over it. The owner of the urn needs to have only seen the object in question, speak their desire into the mouth of the urn, and wait one night, after which the item will miraculously wind up at the bottom of the urn. However, the creature in the urn is somewhat of a kleptomaniac, and if it goes unused for a day, it will steal one random thing from the owner, never to be seen again. 1d20. A weapon. 46 clothing, 7 through 9 potions or liquids, 10 through 12 money, 13 through 15 armor, 16 is a magic item, 17 are spells, 18 is titles, 19 is a body part, and 20 is a name. That's so cool! You have to use this, and it's incredibly powerful. You can steal whatever you want, but if you don't use it, you get stolen from it. It could be as bad as your, your arm. You wake up without an arm. <laughs> Ugh, creepy. But really cool. Magic of the Weird and Wild. Uh, there's a bunch of extra spells that are designed for this book. And some of them are real creepy. Some of them are real cool. Um, yeah. And the Dungeon of Tree and Stones. This is the Wilderness Dungeon. Right? How to make the Wilderness more like a dungeon. Trails as corridors, forest as dungeon, distance as hazard. Generating the dungeon. 
making a hex crawl, rules for that, how to you know, roll you know, flat dice down on another table, connect them with trails, how to do regions, making a really cool little era there. Wild flora, different kinds of flora you can run into. Diseases of the wood, hazards and traps. I search the body table, random trails and paths, a wilderness dungeon with prefixes and suffixes. With the danger, the secret or treasure, a walk through the woods, scenes and types of woods, smells and sounds, encounters and mood, and then a hundred weird locations. Just descriptions of the different kinds of um, different different you know custom places you could run into. The respite of the gray knight, number seventy-seven. Within a glen of ancient trees, upon a mountain of stone and blades, a lone knight sits cross-legged, meditating with a, its with its sword. Clad in resplendent, resplendent silver armor, now graying and tarnished, the knight sits unmoving and silent, wrapped in a tattered blue cape with designs worthy of the greatest tapestries. It will not move unless attacked or challenged to a duel. With the latter, the knight rises into an elegant bow before attacking with a whirlwind of strikes. If the knight is defeated or deems its opponent worthy, it will speak and impart great martial wisdom from an age long gone. Really cool. These are all really awesome uh, entries bring any one of them into your game and it would be a really memorable moment, memorable location. There's an appendix in the back with some tables there, uh, you know, for all the different things you might use with further reading. You can tell one of the influences, well, it says, you know, it's Bloodborne, of course, you can definitely get that sense, but all of these have that dark coming to the horror side of things. Now, one of them it doesn't to me is Redwall. <laughs> this is inspired by Redwall, and I'm not sure exactly why. I guess it's just this idea of the forest and the, the you know, entering into it there, but I'm not sure where else, where else I see that. Uh, influence here. But there's a lot of great influence uh, from a lot of different things. Wormskin um, is one of the, the zine is one of the influences here, and I think you can tell that too. Dark Souls. Call of the Wild, definitely. Um, I would imagine to build a fire goes into that as well, just because of Jack London's uh, <laughs> his ability to portray the wilderness so well. So, uh, this is a really cool book especially if you want that horror tone in your wilderness travel. So I, I recommend it in that case. It's not going to be for everybody. Not every table is going to want this. If you're playing with younger players, right, players who don't like that horror tone, the book has some more, you know, adult, obviously, themes, and certainly some of the art is not for, for little kids. <laughs> and some of the concepts are certainly not for little kids. So if you have, you know, younger tables, stay away from this. But if you don't and you're interested in that more horror tone, then certainly come into, into the Weird and Wild. I, I'd recommend it. The second of these books is Gentle's Dungeon Dun <laughs> I can't say it. Gentle's Dungeon Guide 2. There we go. Uh, now, once again, I love the aesthetic of this book, and this one, you know, it's 70 pages of this. It's this video game theme, and I think a lot of the art is probably AI-generated, I would imagine. Yeah, I think it is. But but not all of it, and um, and it's really well done. Even, like, the um, the AI art... Again, I think it's AI art. <laughs> you know, it's hard to tell these days sometimes, especially when you do the more pixel style, but it seems to me to be more AI art. And it's, it's, it's quite good. It's quite good. Now, if you have seen my video on the other's gentle, gentle Dungeon Guide, then you'll kind of know the idea. There's this skull that's talking to you throughout the book and trying to tell you how to, you know, create a dungeon. And it draws in... Um, a lot of the other ideas from Source of Victory's other books, like the uh, Cyclic Dungeon Generation, it has that kind of brought into this too. So it combines those two documents into this one. So if you have that, you kind of already get a sense of this. Um, game design first, and I think this is really cool. It's great advice for designing a dungeon. Um, Source of Victory is a is a fantastic designer, and the, the advice given here is advice that dungeon designers need to learn. I mean, I've, you know, since I've started this channel, I've been going through a lot of third-party Shadow Dark dungeons to try to find some good ones. And let me tell you, there is a lot, I mean, not just Shadow Dark, I shouldn't just single out Shadow Dark, just generally, there is a lot of very basic dungeons, dungeon design out there. People don't really understand, at least a lot of people don't understand some of these really basic ideas, challenge, agency, tools, and experiences. Um, agency is a big one. The linear room by room dungeon where you start in room one and you go to room two and then you go to room three and then you go to room four and then you go to room five and that's the dungeon. There's just so many of those out there where there's no choice uh, of, of path to go through. There's just this experience and then that experience and the next experience. Um, people took the five room dungeon design too literally and it kind of infected, I think infected is the wrong word, it, 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 it overly inspired people for too long. People took it like right on the nose and I think there's so much of that out there. So. I'm glad that there's this sort of book and this sort of advice out there. So I really recommend it um, for a lot of people. A lot of people. 
uh, cool dungeon history tables and then dungeon purposes. So basically this book has taken the ideas from the first Gentles dungeon guide and then just expanded it. So instead of just like 10 entries, there's, you know, a 3D6 table for the different entries, the purpose of the dungeon um, with the modifier and the type. It's a hanging necropolis or it's a magical portal, right? Or it's a clockwork sanctuary. You roll twice and you take the modifier and type. And again, tons of them. Uh, D666 table. 3D6 table. The dungeon ruin, 2D6 table. What caused the ruin? Uh, the present purpose is just a single D6 table. And then you pull it all together. You put all those three things together. Uh, what was its original purpose? What ruined it? And what's uh, you know what's going on there now? And you put those three together and then you have a cool uh, dungeon already. Uh, D3 factions. If you want to make a large dun dungeon, add D4 more factions. A mega dungeon contains 2D6 plus 1 factions. Practical there. The faction goals, the faction obstacles, faction impulses positive, which is good. And again, a 3d6 table for that. And then faction impulses negative, 3d6 tables for that. Really, really useful. You get faction composition. So what kind of faction is it? Then you pull it all together. You put these for the other for each of these factions. The dungeon exterior, the environment in which the dungeon is found, the path to the dungeon. Is it patrolled? And what, if, it, if it's patrolled, what kind of patrol is it? Is there a hazard? Is it clear? Is there a clue towards the dungeon? Is there a key to the dungeon? The landmark, again, secondary entrances, always important to have for a dungeon, especially a bigger dungeon. The antechamber to the dungeon, that, that, that moment when you're moving from the outside world into the mythic underworld. It should be an important moment. It should be interesting. And then the dungeon interior. First, you draw a diagram, and you use this loop method, the cyclic dungeon generation. Uh, with different, you know, different ways of doing nodes and loops and, and junctions and things like that. Um, and then you populate them, create alternate paths, obstacles, etc. So this is a great book in terms of just, you know, giving you very concrete steps to build your own dungeon. But the concrete steps make, it's not just like, you know, uh, the bare minimum. It's concrete steps with a very good, uh, I would say, game design philosophy behind them. So this is why we do loops. This is why we do junctions, right? This is why we want to populate the dungeon with these sorts of things. Great ideas. And I love this too. Sensory experiences advice. And you can roll, right? <laughs> roll for, okay, this room has a sensory experience. A handout, which is game pieces, right? Uh, a prop or art. <laughs> you build that into the dungeon. So that, okay, in this room you have uh, a map or a crippled note or something that you give the players. And then sometimes you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to find a piece of art for this room and I'm going to show it to them. That's great. Great idea. And, uh, you know, we don't do that enough. Immersion. And that's cool too. What, is there stuff for my different party or the different players to do in this room? Is it, is it a chance for fighters to do something, for priests to do something, for wizards to do something? That's really cool. Narrative moments, challenge moments, fellowship moments, discovery moments. You get abdication moments. Uh, again, and then you just get these encounter advice, uh, combat goals, treasure tables, skill tree clues. A great book for all of this stuff. And then again, if you need inspiration on the nature of each room, you can roll on these tables as well. Now, this isn't the only dungeon design booklet out there, but it's, I think, the most compact, concrete, and precise that I've found. I think I would use this much more than a 500-page dungeon design document. I'm much more likely to use this because it's just again it's it's so straightforward and it's it the you know quality for quantity is the high it's 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 at a very high <laughs> level for this one because you know you can get a lot of good stuff in one of those like really big dungeon design books but you have to really wade through a lot of stuff you're not going to use this book just gives you directly what you can use right there at the very end there's a, a sample dungeon the fallen shrine of strength and uh you know, reasons for everything that's done here and then the end of the dungeon with some reference material and credits and legal stuff at the back. Um, so this is by Taylor Seeley Wright, uh, but it does reference that cyclic dungeon generation and dungeon design elements by Sursa Victory. So uh, Sursa cyclic dungeon generation is really, really good here. Um, it may, made good use of here, and uh, the advice from it is taken. But Taylor Seeley Wright, Seeley Wright I've, I've reviewed some, some of the other uh, things that Taylor's done. Great work in the Shadow Dark system. Uh, I highly recommend Taylor's work. All right, and then finally we get the Great Book of Random Tables. The Great Book of Random Tables. So, as I said before, this is basically just one of a whole bunch of, of PDFs I got in a humble bundle. And I, I'll give you basically an example of the kinds of things you can get in it. <laughs> um, now, again, 
One of the things that I don't like so much about this is that there's so much in here. I can find a lot of this stuff if I Google it. If I Google, you know, uh, random RPG items in a troll's cave, there's probably an online table for it. And I know when I want it, and so I can go right there. Am I going to remember that I have that specific table in this book? Probably not. So when I do want to add random items in a troll's cave, I'm not likely to pick up this PDF. I'm more likely to Google it. Google a random table. Or I'll just have something in mind to, to write. So really what this book is for is inspiration ahead of time. Right? These random table books, like, when they're just full of random tables, they're really for inspiration ahead of time. But there are some really cool ones in this specific one, like Critical Roles. I could see myself opening up this book specifically for the critical fail for melee attack tables, the critical fail for spell attack tables, and the critical success for spell attack tables. I could see incorporating those into a campaign. Being like, hey guys, we're going to use special crit fail tables and special crit success tables for magic. And then I would just bring up this book and I would have those open. But there's a whole bunch of things. Book titles, right? 10 random tables for book titles, critical roles, dungeon room tables, items in them, encounters, jobs, and rumors tables, food tables, items and things tables, names, tables, NPCs, and characters tables. So this is a big book full of <laughs> all of those sorts of things. Book tales, titles. Old silver and new gold is worth 150 gold. Or the hands of fate, which is 50 gold pieces. Or the hidden reasoning of the hermit of the far hills from 100 gold pieces. 50 sermons concerning beauty for 50 gold pieces. Great random uh, uses for certain tree saps, uh, 15 gold pieces. Great book titles and what that book is worth. You go to a library, you loot a wizard's tower, you need random books. Some players are like, what is the book title? Right, You need to have that ready. Wargs, a breeding guide, the fallen ground, the world is broken, the sad rantings of the forgotten hermit, diseases spread by rats, a listing of the carvings found in the valleys of Zo. Some of these could be important to your campaign, some of them could be totally just flavor, but it's fun to have it. Ten tables full of book titles. Critical role tables, these are the ones I really like. So critical fails for melee attacks, right? as simple as the character drops their weapon or as complicated as the character cuts off their own finger, taking d6 damage. <laughs> That's kind of funny. The target dodges and attacks the character. They get a free counterattack. That'd be rough. Critical fails for spell attacks. Now, this is really, really uh, dangerous, right? Because magic often, in, depending on your system, already has penalties for failing. So this is doubling down on that. But you could add it into a game if you wanted magic to be really dangerous. You could add a critical fail for spell attack table. Right, this is 75 is the spell summons a mind flayer. Oh boy. Or the 96, the spell fully heals the target. Could be really good. That could be really bad. You're fighting the final boss, you cast, you know, hold person on him, and you accidentally heal him fully. Oh, that would be bad. And then there's a crit success table you could do too. Flight, long arms, um, inner beast, quicken spell, or extend spell. Right? You get a whole bunch of ideas there. Charming allies. Uh, yeah, more of them, too. <laughs> Baby hand, if you roll 100 on the critical success table for spell attack. One of the target's hands shrinks to infant size and can no longer hold anything greater than 5 pounds. <laughs> so weird. Random tables for dungeon rooms. Uh, tons and tons and tons of these. Uh, random bounty boards. I like that quite a lot. If you're, if you're playing like a West Marches or something like that, or they, you, players go into a town and they want to go find out if there's a bounty in town, you don't have one quickly, you just roll on this table. And you have, boom, a bunch of stuff they could uh, go hunt. Some random catastrophes, desert encounters, forest encounters, forest locations, in encounters, always fun too. One of the encounters is simply a sign that says, out of mead, which would be a disaster for, for my players. Great art too. I like the art in this book a lot. Jobs, jungle encounters, mountain encounters, uh, non-combat encounters, uh, notes in a bottle, road encounters, rumors and odd jobs. You know, we're only 61 pages into this book, and you can tell, like, this is just full of this stuff. And again, the Humble, the humble Bundle that I got had, like, 25 of these books that are all about the same size, all full of unique random tables. So it's tons of awesome random tables, and you could read through them and just roll and get inspiration for a campaign. You're like, I'm going to start an adventure, and I want to just add stuff in. So you get a, a, a Word doc, or you get a piece of paper, and you just go through these books, and you find tables that sound interesting, and you roll a few times on each one. And by the end, your, your, your Word doc or your piece of paper will be full of these things that you can then add into your campaign. I think that's how I would use these books, rather than try to use them at the table or as, as like a specific... Oh, I'm going to remember to use that. There are some that I would remember to use, like the books tables or the crit tables, but mostly 
I would probably use this more as like prep and, and pr preparation and inspiration. So, you know, I'll put links to where you can get these all in the description. We have The Great Book of Random Tables, Gentle's Dungeon Guide 2, and Into the Weird and Wild. So, hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one.